My name is uh, Tony van Roy. I, uh, I'm employed in the Netherlands by the Trimbas Institute. And the Trimbas Institute is an organization that uh, basically works to improve uh, mental health and prevent addictions uh, worldwide, but specifically in the Netherlands. My specific profile is that I focus on uh, games, uh, gambling and media literacy within the company. And what we basically do is we try to, um, to avoid uh, excessive, problematic or addictive gaming, depends on how you want to call it and basically promote responsible use of uh, games and media. Uh, we take a fairly nuanced perspective in the sense that uh, play is a very, very uh, normal activity and uh, digital play is now a part of uh, what children do. Uh, unfortunately, not every, uh, not every game is the same. So we also have a keen eye on the risks uh, associated with, uh, with game use, uh, especially because some people seem to be sensitive to excessive use of games. Um, and we employ those activities basically by uh, providing public information, but we also do research and we do interventions and we're active in schools. And we're also specifically fairly active in addiction care. So uh, that, I guess that's a broad summary of uh, what we do. I hope that's clear, but if there's questions, let me know. You wanna go next, Tom? Shall I go next? Yes, please, Tom. Okay. Sorry. Um, over to you. We have got a few technical glitches, but uh, apparently everybody can hear is fine. So, Tom, if you would like to introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name's Tom Dore. I'm the head of education for the British Esports Association. Um, British Esports is the UK's national body for esports. Um, we are not for profit and we were established in 2016 with permission from the government to work with different stakeholders within industry to promote esports, to promote actually what it is um, and to support everybody within the growing industry here in the UK uh, and wider. Uh, we very much focus on grassroots or amateur esports and on working with young people until they go up to university. Uh, we run the British Esports Championships for schools and colleges, which has seen nearly 300 teams from schools and colleges this year playing each other on a Wednesday afternoon, exactly as you would in a traditional sports. Um, we've also just written a groundbreaking set of qualifications for 14 to 19 year olds. Um, working with a global publisher, education publisher called Pearson, we've written level two and level three BTEC qualifications. Education publisher called Pearson, we've written level two and level three BTEC qualifications, which are the first of their kind in the world. And they will be ready for teaching schools and colleges um, from September onwards. I'm also a teacher. I'm, I'm also still a teacher. I'm, I'm a science teacher and I've taught for the last 15 years uh, across a, a wide variety of different schools from pupil referral units where young people go if they can't attend mainstream schools for social, emotional, mental health reasons, behavior reasons, learning difficulties, right the way through to my current school, which is um, an academically selective school that uh, our results put us in the top 75 um, schools in the country, in, in the UK. So I guess I'm uniquely positioned to talk about both, to talk about education and to talk about esports itself and, and the differences or the, the transition between the two. Thank you, Tom. I would like to hand over the baton to Dr. Marie Christina uh, Gambari from Germany. Marie Christina, over to you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so thanks. I'm Marie from Germany. I'm a teacher and a researcher at the sports psychology department of the University of Münster. I did my PhD in a cross-cultural study, um, seeing the comparison between physical activity in different cultures and also looking at physical activity from a different point. So sport, physical activity, we have organized sports, we have competitive sports, but we have also a lot of physical active free play and cooperation and self-organized sports and physical activity. And um, as my point of view, there could be one part to also integrate it maybe in a PE lesson, for an example, esports, but esports cannot replace sports and physical activity because sports and physical activity, they have so much more for the children, for the physical, for the self-organized and for the self-development for the overall development of children's executive functions, uh, social emotional self-concept and also the intrinsic motivations. So it could be one part to uh, get kind of an experience for children and maybe um, adolescents, but it could never replace physical activity for the children because 
this is essential and um, children grow with physical activity. And the only uh, similarity is really that it's a competition and uh, it's organized and, um, but it's an, and also in hand-eye coordination. So they are the similarities with sports, but physical activity um, are so much more than just competition and just organized. So we have to look really what is essential now for the kids in this um, time, in this uh, COVID crisis now, and how we can bring children to be physical active. And we also have the sports part of project at the University of Münster here with a medicine teacher department and business administration. So we educate um, university students to be a mentor for the children and also one by one mentor to help them now throughout in a digital way to be active. And normally when we don't have this kind of crisis, they are meeting them once in a week um, to be active because to get an equal opportunity for all the children, we need to get children physical active. And this is now in this time, the most important thing. So I'm happy to be with just the experts, um, Tom and Tony, and to discuss a different point of view and maybe how to bring forward physical activity, sports, and also maybe when there's a tool with eSports to bring it forward and um, to help the children all over the world. Thank you very much, Marie-Christina. I think I've managed to sort out the technical glitch. We had an echo coming back from YouTube, so we should be all right now. Um, so thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Tom, I wanted to kind of go back to you because before we started this, this call, we were actually talking about the uh, definition of esports, which seems to be a bit different according to where you are. And I just wondered if you could just highlight that again, because obviously there is quite a demand from certain corners of the world to kind of include esports as an Olympic sport. And I think there are some issues around that. So would you like to discuss? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So let me sort of start with, with the definition of esports, really. Um, esports is organized competitive video gaming. It's always human versus human. So it's not in your bedroom on your own playing against a computer type of video gaming. It is always organized as teams of people playing against other teams of people in a competitive environment. Now, it's an amateur. It runs from amateur right the way through to the professional level now with teams of people one versus one right the way through to games of six versus six or seven versus seven. Um, it can be played socially on, you know, just with your friends. It can be played on uh, mobiles, mobile phones, it consoles, on PCs. At the professional level, it's, um, it is a hugely popular um, pastime. It's a hugely par uh, popular activity. And I'll come on to the sport, esport um, thing in a minute. But at the professional level, there are huge competitions going on, tournaments going on all around the world live studio, live audiences, live stadium audiences of 30, 40, 50,000 people watching these live events. Um, and at the top professional end, sporting organizations like Paris Saint-Germain, Man City, um, uh, Philadelphia 76ers, big global sporting organizations now have their own professional esports teams. And these teams are winning significant sums of money. Professional esports athletes are earning six figure, sal uh, six figure salaries a year. Uh, Dota 2, which is a, a, a a big uh, international game, one of the most popular games around. It's, it's a MOBA game, an acronym, uh, multi, multiplayer online battle arena game. The winning team of five that won the world championships this year won $11 million between the five of them. So it's huge, huge business uh, uh, around the world at the professional level. Um, you can develop all the same sort of skills playing esports as part of an esports team as you do in traditional sports, except it's obviously not necessarily physical activity. So working together as a team, the teamwork, the leadership, the communication, decision making, problem solving, all these things that we acknowledge as being part of a normal team activity, people do through esports as well. Now, you're right, esports is classified differently in different countries. In the UK, esports is classified uh, as a game, not a sport, the same as chess or bridge but it's classified differently around the world. And this um, can create some tensions um, in different countries around young people saying, well, I don't necessarily need to play traditional sport because I'm playing esports. In the UK, we don't have that issue at all. And we very much see it being as a, as a joined up approach. And that's what's happening with the International Olympic Committee as well. 
the uh, the CEO and founder of the British Esports Association, Chester King. He sits on the International Olympic Committee's Esports and Gaming Advisory Group. And there has been push about whether esports is going to be part of the Olympics or not. And actually, very much it, it's not. However, the uh, International Olympic Committee are recognising the, the values within esports and how they uh, link up with Olympic values of competition uh, and of teamwork. And they very much see it as something that is engaging young people. The esports industry is being driven by an age demographic of 16 to 35 year olds, essentially. And so uh, the Olympics are seeing it as a, way, as a way of engaging with young people. Uh, there's talk about what well, there was supposed to be uh, an event happening pre the Tokyo Games in, in June. There was an esports event happening in the week leading up to, to the Tokyo Games in Tokyo um, using uh, two or three different um, esports titles, um, uh, Street Fighter 2, Rocket League, uh, and uh, with, the, with the games being used. Unfortunately, that's not happening now. But what we're seeing, obviously, in lockdown, and we'll come on to this later, is a huge increase in the interest and the public awareness of what esports actually is and how it can be used at this time of lockdown for socialization, allowing young people, allowing people to be with their friends, to socialize with their friends, to compete with their friends uh, and in, in a positive environment. OK, thank you. Um, Tony, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, because obviously uh, Tom is talking about a particular demographic and a, a particular age range. You've done quite a lot of research and longitudinal research uh, around um, gaming and addiction and in, in youngsters. And I sort of uh, wanted to get your view on this in terms of, you know, obviously Tom is highlighting there's, there's the potential for socialization, the potential for kind of meeting your friends. There's, but you kind of have got a slightly different uh, end of the spectrum. And I just wanted to get your view on this. Um, and then before we kind of start moving this into the, the kind of education and the school space. Well, to start off with the, the definition of uh, sports and, and esports as a sport versus a game, uh, that's not particularly particularly my cup of tea, but I would be interested in the comparison between esports then, uh, and which I view sort of as a, a variation of uh, other thinking type sports, such as, I guess, chess or, or darts as compared to more physical sports. And I'm not really in a position to pass judgment on that, but uh, in my mind, it would be classified more in the direction of chess and other uh, slightly less physically active sports, which are still uh, extremely competitive and, and, and teach you a variety of skills. So um, yeah, that, that's my two cents on the definition. And otherwise Tom seems to be fairly, fairly up to date on that. Yep. Uh, but uh, I come at it from a public health perspective and. Um, and also, I guess, from a prevention of, of uh, quote unquote addiction uh, perspective. And, and from a public health perspective, uh, you have to imagine that one of the biggest things we're, chasing, we're facing right now is obesity and uh, physical inactivity. So uh, the question then becomes if the esports are uh, in, the, in, in the school based setting, are they substituting physical activity or are they replacing leisure time activities such as, uh, for example, watching Netflix or doing nothing? which is doing nothing is greatly important for your mental health. Uh, and, and watching Netflix uh, can, be, can be, I guess, a form of that. And, and gaming can also be a, a way to cope with stress and, and, and emotions. Um, and this becomes more complicated with competitive gaming because then it becomes more like a job and, and less like an escape event for emotions, I guess. So there it becomes more complicated. But for young people developing, I guess one of the main questions is the physical activity aspect. Uh, that's point one, I guess. And the second one would be, uh, if you look at uh, the, the question of addiction, well, first of all, you have to realize that there are not a lot, not a lot of people are game addicts in the sense that they need uh, professional intervention. However, there is a, a sizable percentage in, in pretty much every school that you visit these days who are having some trouble controlling their gaming behavior. And you know, they, they might go to bed uh, too late one evening, they might get into trouble one year with school, so they have some minor issues uh, learning to control their gaming behavior. And this is a natural part of growing up, uh, but it does seem to be that gaming is slightly more attractive than a book would be or a movie would be. Uh, so there's that debate in, 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 in teaching children to deal with these temptations. And over the years, the games have gotten increasingly complicated and uh, me new mechanisms and basically new business models are rapidly being introduced. Uh, and in a sense, uh, 
they're, they're fairly experimental in terms of their effects. And, and we've had a huge debates about loot boxes, but there's a few other examples of, of uh, basically uh, business development or pay payment uh, models that are employed in these games, uh, which can be, can be questioned. Uh, so it's, it's quite hard for parents to, tra to keep track of what's happening to their children. Uh, to the point that uh, I would be perfectly comfortable uh, paying a lot of uh, a lot of money for a simple game without microtransactions, loot boxes, and other things. If I uh, personally would be giving a game to my child, so there's there's that aspect to consider, which I guess uh, is, is slightly off topic from uh, from the esports uh, perspective as well. But it it does illustrate the challenges for parents in dealing with games in general. So we have to be specific uh, on what they're doing. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does. It, it actually gives me a good segue to go to Marie Christina, who's obviously a teacher, as well as lots of other things. Uh, and uh, being a, a Global Teacher Prize finalist, um, you know, it would be very interesting, Marie Christina, to have your view with regards to this happening in schools, having listened to um, Tony and also Tom's observation about the demographic. Obviously, you're in Germany, Tom is in, in the UK, so there might be some differences there. But uh, could you highlight a little bit what, what's kind of going on in schools and how you see that? Yeah, of course. Um, well, now here in Germany or where I stayed in the location of uh, Münster, um, is it, of course, they are juveniles and adolescents who are using esports. Um, but the most important thing is the question, like Tony said, uh, their kind of addiction and um, the physical activity aspect. So when it comes to the point, it's about a competition. It's about to take and raise a lot of money, like Tom say, and uh, that a lot of companies invest now in their own esports teams. Um, the aspect from the children and from the juveniles and adolescents who are like need physical activity and sport to develop themselves it's going more on the money point. So I would like to focus more on the aspect which could be useful for children or for adolescents maybe to have an experience with esports and also to see their uh, difficulties and maybe the danger to be uh, in the gaming um, time and be uh, in the game and maybe what can predict it, um, an addiction and um, that they really got to the reflection what is important when we start, for example, uh, esports, and why is it so important when you start esports, for example, when you're going to be adolescent, uh, why it's so important to be active by yourself, to be active with your friends, not only with esports, but outside and um, move your body by yourself. Because what we found out in research is that it's only really their hand eye coordination, there is a significant. Um, research results. So the other physical fitness competence like endurance, like coordination, uh, like strength, like um, flexibility, like uh, these are not really um, trained throughout esports. And these aspects like physical fitness and as well um, other aspects instead of competition because competition for children means um, that there are maybe some winners, but there could be also a lot of losers. So when it comes to children to have the feeling to lose in a game, also in an esports game, it gives them a negative feeling. And uh, we have to use now this time to give children kind of a motivation to get a positive feeling using positive psychology in physical activity, in sporting activities to, to bring kids forward to be physical active again. And um, Maybe in this time, um, is it better to uh, have one tool for children, maybe to uh, help them kind of to see also the difficulties with esports? Um, and also, it's a game, it's not a sport. And I think it's very important that we have to point this out that it could be a better game than other gaming like esports. So it's better than, for example, the other shooting games and other stuff like this. So, this is a better chance for the children. but. It can never be a sport it's because it's defi defined as really um, as a game and not as a sporting and not as physical activity because uh, it doesn't have these kind of uh, all the effects. Although Tom said, yeah, it's socially because they interact with friends. Yes, that's true. 
but a difference when you do be physical active with your friend outside, for example, when you have physical active free play, when you have self-organized cooperative physical activity and in sport instead of competition. And maybe you, you should use uh, maybe in this time esports more to look at the perspective that maybe it's not a competition, maybe to bring kids together and children to uh, be physical active in a cooperative way. Sure. And, yeah. yeah, sure. That um, kind of... Yeah. I, I just want to kind of uh, quickly uh, interject on that, if I may, because um, what I'm also quite interested in here in, in finding out from, from all of you is actually the potential for esports and learning, because we're very much focusing now on is it active? Is it physically active? Is it, you know, what is it doing to emotions? But, you know, there are kind of theories and there are people who study esports as a tool for learning, as an enhancer for learning. Or some people might say it's a detractor to learning because of what it's doing. But, you know, some esports advocates will definitely sort of highlight that actually to play esports effectively, you need to strategize. So, you know, you can actually build kind of quite uh, some problem solving skills around it. We have some, some strategy skills around sort of how you, how you approach that game. So I was, I was wondering if we could sort of maybe take the discussion in, in that direction a little bit, rather than just focusing on the physical versus the, the game versus the sport. So Tom, from your perspective and from your organization's perspective, obviously you're, you're kind of close to this. Um, what, how do you perceive the kind of learning aspect for, um, for you know, esports and, and what the benefits can be? Sure. I, I think there are, there are obvious links to, to STEM-based subjects and to computer science. Uh, there really are on the technical side of, of the gaming. I'll give you an example of we're doing some work in alternative provision schools where young people go where they can't attend mainstream schools. And we managed to um, borrow 24 high-spec gaming PCs to loan into these schools for a period of time to to play esports, to play in a tournament um, against other schools. And uh, amongst other positives that we that came out of this, increases in, in, uh, in attendance rises up to 10 to 15, even 20% for some individuals. Their attendance rose at school whilst they're part of this competition. Uh, the socialization aspect, there were young people who were, there was one lad in particular who was a selective mute at school and violent towards members of staff. But during the time the tournament was on, he, it turns out he's massively into esports. During the time that the tournament was on, he actually started speaking at school for the first time uh, in a long time. He actually ended up coaching two of the other younger students at the school as part of the team. Um, in those schools, when these students, when the teachers were bringing these computers out of the boxes, we have three separate reports from three separate schools from the teachers saying the first thing the kids were doing was looking through the side of the computer. Lots of these high spec gaming PCs have transparent sides so you can see all the working parts inside. And the students were saying, oh, look at that processor. Uh, look at that graphics card. Look at that cooling system. Wow, that, that's amazing. This is a great piece of And they were engaging with the technology that's involved with this. Um, Computer science, I don't know if it's the same throughout European countries, but the numbers of students taking computer science in the UK has dropped in the last three or four or five years since the, the curriculum changed in this country. And so it's a real opportunity for teachers, for computing teachers, for example, to be engaging with students um, to set up esports clubs in their schools to be then because part of the, the, the great thing about being a teacher is engaging with young people outside of the classroom to then bring that learning into the classroom, to bring that positive relationship back into the classroom that can then be built upon in your subject and in your classes. For computer science teachers to be running um, esports clubs, esports competitions in their schools, to create these positive relationships with their students outside of the classroom so that when they then come into their lessons, they can promote then the use of computers, the, 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 um, the careers that now exist within the esports industry, the careers, the linked careers and the digital um, in the, in the di digital economy that now exists around the world. So, um, yeah, if I may, if I may add to that. Yes, please. Well, this this uh, Tom story makes perfect sense to me and I know firsthand that games can be incredibly motivating. And uh, to respond to Marie Christine's comment, um, we have to be careful not to expect something from uh, esports or digital gaming that's not actually there. So you can't, you can't really say uh, this is, uh, doesn't have physical benefits. Well, obviously it doesn't because it's not a very physical activity. 
uh, Pokemon Go would be or playing on a Nintendo Wii perhaps, but sitting around playing League of Legends, you, you would not expect a lot of physical uh, benefits from that. But uh, in my mind, after doing uh, many years of research on this subject, uh, I think you have to make a trade-off between it might be detrimental for your body to sit still for incredible amounts of time, but so is my job, to be honest. Uh, I'm behind a screen all day, but I do that because there are some significant gains for me. And the gains might be uh, a feeling of performance, a feeling of being in control, a feeling of being connected to others. And all these things, uh, esports can be. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, uh, very much on board of that, with that. But you, you have to be very clear about um, what you're actually uh, discussing here, because is it uh, providing an avenue for students to grow into professional gamers, like for example, they would become a professional soccer player, or are you providing esports like Tom discusses as a motivational tool for specific kids that might benefit from it? Um, but if it's the first, I think at least in the Netherlands, we need, we need professional recognition and professional infrastructure and good management for these kids. So that, for example, they have a backup career. Because uh, exactly. like any professional sports, uh, this is going to be tough. It's going to be stressful. And some of them are not going to make it, even if they're good. Uh, because uh, any professional sport is a low uh, success uh, situation, which is why we have good schools and good management for uh, aspiring athletes for all, all other sports. So I'm fully on board with that. But uh, from my prof professional background, I also uh, per I personally struggle a little bit with providing esports athletes as an example. Uh, because it can be used to legitimize, to legitimize extreme amounts of gaming. Because, for example, if nobody gives you feedback that you're not going to make it, but you think you're, this is your way to, uh, to the big money, uh, like Tom discussed, the big money can be an attractor. Um, yeah, well, well, why not uh, drop your grades and uh, why not spend 11 hours a day uh, training for that, uh, that eventual win that you know is going to come? So these people need good management. And... The role model thing I really struggle with because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite convinced we should be uh, using uh, esporters as role models. And actually, in our uh, latest uh, uh, the campaign we did for Trimbos, we actually diverted from esporters and we uh, we ended up using uh, video uh, video game vloggers instead. And the vast and the vast majority of, uh, of young people are not going to become professional esports athletes exactly like. Same with football, same with, with any traditional sport. Um, what it does do is, is it helps to develop a, a huge range of transferable skills, be they tech skills, be they things in new media, for example, the streaming side of things or video production side of things. Um, it could be designing merchandising for, um, for an esports organization, you know, entrepreneurship, young people setting up their own esports organizations. Huge, huge transferable skills, let alone the, the, the networking, the tech side of things. At some of these big live esports events, there are hundreds of people working behind the scenes on the tech side of things in terms of the streaming, in terms of the security aspects of it. There are huge, huge transferable skills. I, I could be quite bullish about it and say even more so than if you do a sports science um, course or something like that and you want to work in football. Okay, that I would suggest that through esports and the transferable skills you can develop, um, there are more linked industries within the STEM industries and within the digital tech industries um, that are more appropriate. Okay, yeah, I, I kind of uh, hear what you're saying, Tom, and I, I, I can see that very clearly. I do have a question, though, and it's also a question that seems to be arising from, from, from the audience. And okay. I will start with Marie-Christina, because Marie-Christina, you also work on your um, sport pattern uh, project with uh, kids who are living in deprived areas who don't necessarily have access to a lot of things. Yes. Now, with esports, this question also arises because, you know, is it inclusive? Is it gender bias? Um, all these kind of things obviously keep popping up. And I just wondered from your perspective, given, you know, the project that you're running and sort of inclusion, uh, how you see that working with esports? I can definitely see it work, but obviously certain things would need to happen. So I would love to hear your take on that. Yeah, sure. So uh, with the inclusion point of view, um, for example, when we have the sports mentor project and we take care for kids with socially deprived backgrounds, we uh, need to show some of the children how to ride a bike. We need uh, to show the children how to maybe jump or uh, do a jumping with a rope. So there are a lot of aspects that the children need to discover. So um, 
And these are, which are pointed out before, are essential for an overall growing. When you now look at esports, and when you have a group of children who are six years old, seven years old, eight or nine years old, or 10 years old, and also in the early adolescence time, um, it could be not the same um, for like growing and for inclusion, because we have also one child who has a muscle dystrophy, um, muscle sorry, I'm not sure for the English word, actually, muscle dysmorphic order. So yeah. um, for him, it's it's quite important to um, get engaged with physical activity, but he has to be very careful because the muscles cannot grow like by other humans. And we also have refugee children um, in our target group of the sports mentor project. And uh, these children sometimes have a trauma. We have children with a very less self-concept, which um, also need a person, a mentor who believes in this child. So what I think it's quite important and um, this actually cannot give esports actually, is there a um, mentoring program? Is there one by one? It's not about competition in our sports mentor program. It's not about being better than the others. It's not about to win the game. It's about to enjoy physical activity, to enjoy and to get started with sporting activities and to have fun with physical activities because when you have fun, you really enjoy it more and you be active also when you are grown up and also with a high obesity level and other things which are quite important. Um, yeah. So inclusion um, is a point, so esports is from a like a computer science teacher point of view, it could be a perfect tool to introduce to children and also maybe to introduce to children um, who um, maybe have not the possibility to, to be physical active at all. Yes, but at the same time, we really have to be careful um, to highlight it out so much that there's a socially, emotionally, which we can also, um, support with uh, sport and physical activity and um, it I think it's quite a good tool for computer science teachers or for teachers to uh, kind of make an experience for children or to kind of be a coach to help them and to uh, see the positive and the negative things about it but I think you have to be very careful if esports um, can be also inclusive, like physical activity or sports can be inclusive, like skateboarding or other things which are like, or dancing, which are like kind of um, pointed out the collective self, like uh, everybody can dance and uh, everybody can join, the uh, can join the game. It's about a collective self being together and just enjoy uh, the dance. So I think we have now the point of view is uh, that we have a competitive uh, sport and there's a lot of similarities uh, to competitive sports, yes. And they are like the teams and the enjoyment of the teams when they are starting to win. And this could be very positive effects for these children who are winning in the game in the school. But what happened to other children maybe who are not being successful in these games? So I think we also have to have a look of these children. And this has also something to do with inclusion because uh, when kids don't have this kind of equipment in school or at home, how can they be part of it? And we have also some of the children who doesn't even have a laptop or an iPad to communicate now and to do their homework and um, to now in this time of COVID uh, get access to these kind of things. So we have to be very careful to um, link it always to sport. So I think it, it could be a great part of game, which includes sport in this kind of game as a tool, yes. but. Okay. It uh, has not the same inclusion, positive inclusion effects for children to integrate at other things as the normal. Okay. Can, can, can I can I come back? Can yes, I come back certainly. to, to yes. that, please, if I may? Um, I'll just put some statistics. This is these are UK statistics, and they they come about from Ofcom, who are the office, the government regulatory body for for communications, broadcasting communication industry, and they do a survey of um, young people every year. It's an annual report. Okay, so it says 93% of young people aged between 10 to 16 play video games in the UK. The 81% of 12 to 15 year olds play video games on average for nearly 12 hours a week. And that 49% of girls aged between five to 15 play video games, which is up 12% from the year before. Okay, so we have a huge number of young people and I'll take the point in terms of the access to equipment. 
Um, the same thing goes with, with sporting activities. And I think we're getting hung up very much here on whether it's a sport versus esports. That's not what this should be about. Everything we're promoting is all about balance and moderation. Everything has to be done in balance and moderation. Um, sport, young people need to be doing sport. Um, young people can be doing esports as a separate activity in their own right. Esports is an opportunity to engage a wider demographic of young people. So if you're not into tra traditional sports, if you don't play for the sports team at school, if you're not um, in, the, in the, the music, if you don't play in the orchestra, if you're not part of the drama, where are you getting your team-based activity from and the holistic character development skills that we know through come, come through being part of a team? It doesn't always have to be competitive. Yes, the, the, uh, the definition of esports is competitive play, but competitive play can just be playing with your friends rather than representing your school or representing your college or playing for a professional team. Esports is actually age neutral and it's gender neutral. It's even disability neutral. We have got examples from the schools and colleges here in the UK where we've had physically disabled young people playing via um, amended uh, keyboards, amended mice, amended controllers. There's a ph phenomenal charity called Special Effects here in the UK whose, whose mission is to uh, create amended equipment to allow physically disabled uh, people to play. So actually we have um, mixed teams playing in the championships. We even have all female teams playing in the championships um, that, that we have running. Um, so actually it is a very um, diverse community and it's a hugely strong community within the esports. Um, uh, so it's a massive community sense and support and people find belonging that they maybe didn't find in traditional sport. And again, we've got examples of young people who haven't, don't play for the, the, the first 11 football team or the first 15 rugby team, yet they succeed in esports and therefore schools and colleges can celebrate the, their success in exactly the same way that you have an assembly to reward people. Well done, the, the, local, the football team has won the local championships or won the local cup. Okay, there's a lots of young people who never get that opportunity through traditional sport, or through traditional music. Esports can provide that for some young people. Tom, can I just uh, um, ask uh, an extra question to that then? And um, that is, you know, if you bring it back to a kind of, um, you know, formal education setting, sure. um, because obviously that's also what some of the people in the audience will be interesting, uh, interested in. Um, how does that typically work uh, with the work that you do? Is it like after school cl yeah. uh, clubs or how is that typically done? And what do schools need to do to kind of get access to this? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it is an extracurricular activity essentially. It is like playing in for the local for the school football team. It's exactly the same thing having an esports team essentially. Um, like with traditional sport, you'll have practice and opportunities to practice at lunch times and after schools. The most successful teams that we're seeing and the most successful schools and college teams that we're seeing are those that have the opportunity to practice at school um, at lunch times or after school. What we do in schools and colleges is very much online safety is critical and safeguarding is key. So all the competitions that we run, the British school, uh, the British Esports Championships is run from school or from college being supervised by an adult member of staff. It's, placed, it's played in a closed community group. So only those schools and colleges um, registered with us can access that group to play against each other. It means that there's an adult member of staff there facilitating at all times, uh, exactly as you would in a traditional sporting, uh, traditional sporting activity. Um, the thing that schools and colleges need is equipment. If I'm perfectly honest, it's kit. Um, and it tends to be PCs that have graphics cards. Graphics cards are the, the things that we're finding that a lot of schools and colleges don't have. That said, that when they are upgrading PC equipment in schools and colleges, we are hoping and the messages that we're putting out there about esports is if you buy PCs, you know, another 50 pounds on a graphics card will then allow young people to access esports, but also better access things like media courses or art and design courses, photography courses, uh, design, all that sort of stuff will be better able to be taught using higher spec PC equipment. So you're kind of scaffolding it in, into other uh, curricular activity as well, although you're putting it outside as a, as a kind of extracurricular club. You it's kind a of vehicle. trying to link, to link it to the rest of yeah, the Yeah, it's, it's a vehicle yeah. to motivate and to engage. It's an opportunity to engage a wider demographic of young people um, who might not be into those traditional activities. And as a teacher myself, 
and if there are other teachers watching the stream you'll be able to pick those young people in your schools or your colleges that you teach for whom this could be the hook this could be the hook to get into them to really motivate them uh, in order to bring that motivation back into the classroom in an academic environment and to give them a pathway that they can follow they can follow their passion and it might not be that they become a professional esports athlete but there are then opportunities, other career education and then career pathways that then exist that they can then go and follow. In the US, for example, there are over 200 colleges in the US now that offer scholarships for esports exactly in the same way as they do for traditional sports. Um, and that's all happened over the last 18 months. And so let's fast forward another 18 months, two years, five years, 10 years. This is going to be huge. It's like you know, the, the issues around media. 10, 15 years ago and media courses first started to being developed. There was a hoo-ha around that. I know, what do we need this? What, why is it, what's this all about? The same thing I would say is, I would suggest is going to happen with esports in another 10 years time. If we're looking back, esports is going to be the part of the norm of what we do. If I may, if I may ask Yes, something. please. I was just going to ask you and, to uh, it's jump gonna, in. It's, it's going to be mildly critical of uh, both Marie, Christine and Tom uh, on their specific points. Just to provide the soundboard. Uh, Marie Christine, uh, many of the things you said uh, holds true for if you interchange sports, esports gaming by chess, you would have uh, pretty much all of the same arguments you listed. So then the question would be, uh, of course, it's it's uh, good for children to be in a competitive environment, but then you would not choose esports, but you would choose another type of video game or another type of activity. So uh, yeah, then. The arguments you mentioned could be could also be arguments for saying you wouldn't you would not have a school chess tournament, and if that's your point of view, and that's fine with me. Uh, I'm not really strongly opinionated about competitive sports in general, but sports seem to be competitive, so uh, we can't really completely uh, take that off the table because apparently it's here and it's fairly motivating. Um, and then to switch it up to Tom, uh, you make a strong case, but. Uh, and I see many, I see many, many positive sides of video game, uh, competitive video games. And I've played some myself. Uh, I have to say I suck. So uh, I get some negative experiences as well. People call me names. They think I'm, uh, they think I'm doing poorly. And to be honest, it's stressful as hell. I come home after a long day of working, then I log in and then some 12 year old is uh, calling me names because I apparently suck at League of Legends, uh, which is true, but still it's not that relaxing. So uh, there's that. But uh, my criticism would be, or my question would be to you, the, uh, why, do we, why do we need to legitimize this by connecting it to STEM and technical skills and things like that? And it makes some kind of sense. Uh, and I have to say, I know plenty of examples of, I know that for example, uh, in more technical educated, uh, technical schools where children with more technical affinity are, there's also more gaming. There's also more gaming problems, by the way. Uh, it's harder to deal with the subject because uh, they're always gaming and they're always involved in the technology. Uh, but why, why do we need to legitimize it that way? And if we do, I don't think the, the argument you present is super, super strong necessarily because it's fairly indirect. It's they get an interest in technology and then it might result in a te technological career or something along those lines. And um, I don't want to be too critical, but uh, why do we need to legitimize it in, in that way? It can just be we don't need to legitimize chess as, for example, preparing you for a strong analytic career where you end up as a management consultant doing strategic consulting because you happen to be pretty good at uh, opening with a horse uh, by moving to E4 or something. So, um, yeah, this, right. is, this seems to be a fairly general point to close it off uh, about gaming. Gaming is generally placed in a position where as a pastime or as an activity, it has to defend itself uh, doubly strongly against pretty much everything. And uh, you can easily remedy that by just replacing it with another type of activity and seeing if it, if it still so strongly needs, needs to be defended. Yeah, good point. So I, 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 I think in terms of legitimizing it in, in schools and colleges, I think it's just another extracurricular activity, isn't it? It's legitimizing it in the sense that it wants, we, we want it to be seen on a par with other extracurricular activities that are going on. And that there are then the links that can be made to these other to these other things. I think where we're coming from as an organization is that we want to set standards, essentially. The, the, the toxicity that you mentioned in games, in the bad mouthing and things like that, like we, we need to teach young people and we, we're the adults here, we need to teach young people how to behave, essentially. 
um, like we need to teach about the safe use of mobile phones, the safe use of technologies and things like that. This is what this should be as well. And to set standards as educators, essentially, to help young people to understand what is acceptable and what is not. Likewise, keeping themselves safe online and not understanding what to do if they find themselves in a situation that they're not comfortable with. And we're trying to ask the right questions within the industry, uh, esports industry, within the video gaming industry and wider is to let's set some standards. And I mentioned about how we will play our championships from schools and colleges. We're also now developing a platform whereby just we can guarantee it's under 18s playing. So what are parents worried about? They're worried about the amount of time they're playing, who they're playing with online and the age appropriateness of the games. Um, we're developing a platform at the moment that addresses all those issues um, as a membership, as a private membership platform. We've also developed parents guides as well, because a lot of parents understand different genres of music, different genres of film and what therefore is appropriate for, for their young people and the age verification, the age categories that go with that. Not enough parents yet understand that about different genres of video games. And, and so when parents start understanding the details of a MOBA versus an FPS <clears throat> versus a Battle Royale game. And the fact that Fortnite has actually got, in the UK anyway, it's got a 12 rated, uh, an, an, an age 12 rating. So when you see um, headlines in, in tabloid newspapers, my nine-year-old son's addicted to Fortnite. Well, they shouldn't be playing Fortnite in the first place because it's a 12 rated game. And so there are issues that we've got to do, we've got to address in a wider sense uh, like that to really support parents to understand what their young people are doing and what they want to do and therefore what is safe and what is appropriate and what we mean by balance and what we mean by moderation uh, because we're not condoning playing these games for a long period of time. Um, moderate screen use, um, the University of Oxford, the Oxford Inter Internet Institute um, released a study um, in February, uh, not October last year, saying about moderate screen time, moderate screen usage actually being a positive in terms of social emotional well-being and that's not not just gaming it's about a digital device use it's about screen use as well mm -hmm. so there are lots of uh wider conversations around digital time and di di uh, appropriate digital uh usage that we need to have as well marie christina what what um is your reaction to this because you know what i hear from both tony and tom i can see some really distinct positives in terms of what this can do, uh, provided it's obviously being kind of scaffolded and being sort of um, standardized, perhaps, and, and being kind of um, approached with a lot of careful consideration, like, you know, don't sit still for 12 hours a day, go and kick a ball outside, you know, go be, look at it in, in a kind of combination rather than an either or. So from your perspective, how do you see that work? Like with all the media consumption, it's quite important that it has to be moderate and that it has to be also kind of like in the school, like coaching how to handle all these kind of things. And what I think is very important is to point out that it could be a great tool for, like Tom said, for teachers to get in touch with the children, especially for those who are kind of very um, into this kind of gaming. But uh, and also get off kind of uh, reflecting process what is good in this kind of esports and also when they are a nine year old um, instead of Fortnite that they really use uh, in gaming esports because they can learn much more instead of these other kind of things which is uh, not for these kids in this age at all. So I think it's um, quite important to see some good point of views which they both pointed out Tony and. and Tom especially, that we can get engaged with the children maybe um, who are kind of uh, not so much in the focus or maybe not in the traditional sports clubs who are maybe falling behind. So this is a good tool to get attention to these kids. And um, that's what I see. That's a good thing to maybe integrate it um, in a computer science course in an extra curriculum AG because it's kind of uh, controlling. It's kind of coaching. We, you can really coach the children to get inside of this. But um, as a side, same time, it's quite important that the children um, need to go out to play with a ball so that they're not instead of getting addicted 12 hours per day. And there's always kind of a danger when some of the kids starting to get in this kind of gaming, which we all know from computers game. So I played with the Commodore 64 back <laughs> in the, the 90s. Uh, and I experienced one time in summertime where I really played like eight hours because I really want to win this kind of game. So we really have to be 
get a well intention for the kids or for the adolescents to recognizing what it can have kind of the effects because when you start seeing I can win the game you want to continue and that's a psychology point of view and when you call about the traditional sports and the esports they are that's true there are similarities and especially maybe for kids who uh, cannot move at all it's a chance to also uh, discover the team feeling of a sports team with esports and I totally agree with you But at the same time, we have to look in sport, maybe from a different point of view. So we have a classical point of view and a definition of sport, but we have also a wider definition of sports and physical activity, which is not competitive, which is more cooperative and which and also research shows like from March and other cross-cultural or research that um, the cooperation um, to interact positive with others in uh, physical activity or in sports it has a much better chance to get a higher self-concept um, it's the same with sports club in the adolescence times when you're not being in the best you're not you're not in the game so the trainer are not bringing you in the game so you really experience okay i'm when i'm not the best i'm not counting so i just sit on the bank And um, this is why we have a high dropout in uh, the sports clubs. And also um, we get a more and more higher physical inactivity level. So I think maybe we can use also esports to bring um, children who may be not into sports or physical activity to sport to do physical activity things again and maybe to combine it as a tool to see the positive chance of both of these sides and maybe to create some sporting activities in esports who are more in a cooperation way instead of in a competitive way, and especially to, to bring positive um, success feelings for these children to also have kind of a feeling, yes, I can mm. win, and I can also be a winner of all the winners, for example. Okay, so can I just kind of uh, step in here, because um, I'm kind of conscious of time as well. Um, I think we, we've kind of landed on a very inter interesting discussion But if I, if I sort of uh, was going to ask you one more kind of double question sort of regarding putting this into a school context, you know, obviously it's clear that this needs to be kind of guarded, uh, scaffolded, that, you know, it, it needs kind of uh, supervision, it needs standards, it needs safeguarding, all these good things that can actually make it very, very successful. So I'm going to ask each of you uh, one question uh, to, to run round up is you know so Tom and Mary Christina and Tony from your perspectives if we looked at uh, esports in an education setting how do you think it could promote kind of you know gender um, equality or inclusion and what do you think the best way forward is to do this and to kind of get esports in the in into education in a positive sense You might not agree with the positiveness in that case that's absolutely fine but you know sort of I'd, I'd like to kind of round off on, on on this question if I may so uh, Tony can I perhaps start with you yeah, uh, I was worried about that uh, sure let, uh, let's go ahead um, <laughs> well regarding the gender issue I've actually done quite a lot of research on uh, video games and uh, I have some bad news for you uh, video game use is strongly gendered Uh, men uh, prefer other games than girls do, uh, or, uh, or or than women do, uh, to be more specific. Uh, that's just uh, the, the, that's the demographic fact right now. Uh, and we, and we, it seems to be the current situation that girls play different types of games. For example, in our studies, they uh, they tend to prefer the more casual, mobile mobile type, uh, smartphone type games, whereas men seem to be uh, some somewhat stronger uh, attracted to more in-depth online games and specifically those types of games that would also be used for esports. Now, I don't know the exact cause for this. It might be a cultural thing. It might be uh, some other type of uh, mechanism. I don't know. And, and I don't have a very strong opinion on changing that because uh, I don't know the reasons and I don't, it, yeah, why would I want to change that at this point? Um, um, so yeah, that, that's just the way it is right now. Uh, but uh, like Tom said, uh, anybody's free to participate in these games. And even in these games where, uh, where boys are more dominant than girls, there's always been girls as well. When I was playing World of Warcraft, there were female raid leaders. Uh, in, in, in Fortnite and even in the streaming communities, there's female streamers. 
So the, the, the space is very accessible to women, uh, I think. There might be some cultural issues with harassment, etc. But that, like Tom said, that's also an issue of adult involvement and strong standards and strong visions on what's tolerated and what's not tolerated. So uh, you should probably try to avoid a toxic masculine culture where uh, excesses are normalized. And, and this, in a sense, is something that the gaming industry needs as a whole. That's uh, professionalization. And that's also something I, I would strongly communicate to Tom as you have an incredible opportunity with esports to also set a clear example from, um, from this, is, this is balance. Uh, sh you should also be physically active. This is how your body works. This is how your mind works. If you're angry in a game, don't take it out on other people, but learn from it, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that you, you would learn in a regular sport as well because uh, nobody would tolerate you beating up somebody with a hockey stick. And it should not be normal to uh, shout, people, uh, shout people down on, in the, on the internet in League of Legends as well. Um, but that uh, apparently is how the internet works. So I don't take it personally. Okay. So th that's uh, my two cents on that. And then regarding the integration in schools as a motivational tool and, and on top of a curriculum, I think that's, that's excellent and fine and fitting if it's properly supervised. But you should prob probably not give the people the illusion that they're going to make a, a lot of money by getting involved in this career without good management. And if they happen to be a talent, then fine. They need a good coach and they need a good, uh, a good manager and a good team. and Maybe not give up on their uh, formal education. So we need to professionalize that. And then it's fine with me. Um, yeah, I guess that's my two cents on that. Thank you very much. Very nice two cents too. Um, Marie Christina, would you like to kind of just uh, give your final sort of um, thoughts on this and, and how this can actually be beneficial or not beneficial in an educational setting? So in an educational setting, it could be beneficial if it's really get these children who may be already playing games and which are more can be guided by the teachers, which, which can also kind of really reflect how much gaming is okay and when it's getting too much like eight to 12 hours gaming then it could be a good thing because uh, gaming and esport it is already now um, in the adolescent's life in this in the, the life we have now so the children should be guided to really reflect on these kind of things um, but at the same time it's quite important and um, also tom pointed this out already that they need to be physically active in a normal way. And um, maybe also not in traditional competition sport, maybe to have a look more on um, informal sport settings like skateboarding, like climbing, like dancing, which where it's no competition at all, where it's more about um, with their peer group, helping each other, um, showing the next trick, um, it's more about the inner self to, to grow yourself with these kind of physical and sporting activities. So I think it could be a chance to really get children and um, adolescents who are already in the gaming to really get them into discover sporting, discover teaming, but at the same time, they need to also go out and be active by themselves and um, do sporting activities. And maybe not because they're always doing it then in the e-sport competitive way, maybe in more doing it because for the physical self, because of the medicine, ex um, medicine aspects like diabetes, because when you're physical active, you don't have, uh, uh, you, you will not get um, diabetes because um, you are active a lot. And um, so I, I think this is very important. It could be a chance, yes, but you have to really guided these children and um, as I said in the beginning it can never replace physical activity and sporting and um, I really say now physical activity and sport and not traditional competition sport because we have to have a wider look at physical activity and sport and not a very all on the competitive games. Okay thank you very much. Uh, Tom, inclusion, gender, uh, Reacting to what uh, Christina has said, um, to wrap up the conversation, uh, I'd like your two cents, please. Sure. I, I think that just to link to what Tony said is, is true, what he was saying in terms of the, the differences between male and female split. Games like Candy Crush, we know that women play a lot more 
than the type of games that we're talking about in esports. And there's there's different arguments or different um, different thoughts behind that process. What I would say is that the, the competitive aspect is, is big, and one of the things that we find in a lot of players, athletes, whether they are male or female, is that they say they got into this because they like competing, because they 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 like to compete. Um, We've just established our uh, British Esports. We've got a, a women in esports um, campaign and, and an all women committee that they had a meeting today, actually. They had a board meeting today and we're very much highlighting the different roles that um, women are playing within the esports industry and, and the wider linked industry to it. So we're, we're highlighting to, to young women the opportunities that do exist and putting forward role models uh, for them. But it is still a male dominated industry, you know, 70, 75, 80 uh, percent male dominated. Um, we're doing some work in primary schools where we're starting a little bit, uh, starting looking at developing esports a little bit younger, because in primary schools, there's a lot of mixed sport happens anyway. And boys and girls are used to playing football, cricket, hockey against with e alongside each other. So we're, we're doing some pilots ar around that and linking to traditional sports as well. Um, so it's all. Uh, it's all together, essentially, because uh, one point of view is that by the time that girls get to 12 or 13, if they that's when they start trying to play esports, or um, and boys have been playing for another four previously for four or five years, um, they could get put off easily. Um, so there's different opportunities for further work ar around that area. There is, um, in theory, esports, as we've said, is 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 a level playing field. It's age neutral. It is gender neutral. Anybody can play if they wish. However, we've got to make sure that any hurdles that do exist or barriers that do exist, that, that we address those. Now, in terms of the, the, the wider, um, to, to round off, I guess, the, the wider aspect of education, esports and education, I just want educators to understand the opportunities that exists, to understand what esports actually is and the opportunity that exists to engage young people with it. So many of our young people are playing video games are playing different esports games. If you look on a website called Twitch, twitch.tv, it's where young people go to, or people go to watch other people play video games to play esports. Um, it, it, just look at the numbers of people online right now, uh, essentially. Um, there's one streamer, um, one page on there, Summit1G, who's had 35 million hours of viewership in the last month, just on that one streamer, okay, playing esports titles. This is massive industry that people don't necessarily, educators, senior leaders in education don't necessarily know exists. There are lots of opportunities to engage young people with it and engage young people positively with it, to set the standards like we've talked about, to link to what is balance, what is motivate, uh, moderation, to link to physical activity still and sports and being healthy, healthy body, healthy mind. And so I think there are lots of discussions that people can have within the edu education industry over the coming 6, 12, 18 months around this and how they can incorporate it into what we do already and to make it another offer to engage a wider demographic of young people. Thank you very much. It certainly leaves a, um, a lot of food for thought um, and it's not a discussion that we kind of uh, can sort of wrap up in, in one hour's talk because it's got so many facets. But it's been wonderful just kind of digging into some of this with, with the three of you and to get a little bit more insight in, into the different perspectives and also, you know, the opportunities that are out there and the challenges that come with those opportunities, um, which uh, makes it even more exciting from my perspective, because, you know, that is definitely uh, something that, you know, we should kind of engage uh, with from, from these different perspectives. And I think for, you're right, Tom, I think for educators, um, there's definitely an opportunity to start engaging with this now and to sort of see how this can be introduced into a, uh, an educational setting that will benefit any child that is interested in kind of taking part in this and that feels that this is something that they can belong to. Um, and so from that perspective, I think, you know, the, the world is a little bit our oyster and the, the challenge is, you know, what do people like yourself, Tom, uh, being involved in, in this organization, do with this challenge to make this happen? 
Um, and then also, you know, people like Tony, how does the research back this up? And people like Mary Christina who work in, in sort of with kids in deprived areas, what does that mean for them? So there's so many facets to kind of look into and discuss further. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to do so, to do so before very long. Uh, but in the meantime, I would love to thank you all for taking part in this and making the time to be here with us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Sure. You're Thank welcome. You.